good morning and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. This is week nine of our 52 week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, prophets, and Yeshua's words. Reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Genesis. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we ask for guidance. We ask for your wisdom. May you bless each and every one who watches or listens. And Father, may you continue to work in us that we may understand you and love you better. May we walk in obedience. May we walk the talk so that we can be more like Yeshua. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the fellowship. May you bless each and every one in the group and those who listen afterwards. We ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everyone. A quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. Also, any comments that you have, you are welcome to post on the general chat channel. This is our master schedule, and as you can see, this week's portion includes chapters from Genesis, Isaiah, and Matthew. We are going to deep dive on the Torah portion, and we highly recommend that you would read the Prophets and Yeshua portions at your leisure. So today we are covering chapter 33 through 35 of Genesis. Let us begin. This is Genesis chapter 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau was coming and 400 men were with him. And he divided the children among Leah and among Rachel and among the two of his female slaves. And he put the female slaves and their children first, then Leah and her children next, then Rachel with Joseph last. And he himself passed on before them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell upon his neck and kissed him and they wept. Then Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? And he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the female slaves drew near, they and their children, and they bowed down. Then Leah and her children drew near and bowed down. And afterward Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. And he said, What do you mean by all this company that I have met? Then he said, To find favor in the eyes of my Lord. Then Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, you must take my gift from my hand, for that I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have received me. Please take my gift, which has been brought to you, for God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, so he took it. Then he said, Let us journey and go on, and I will go ahead of you. But he said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and the flocks and the cattle which are nursing are a concern to me. Now if they drove them hard for a day, all the flocks would die. Let my Lord pass on before his servant, and I will move along slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and Sarah. And Esau said, Let me leave some of my people with you. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So Esau turned that day on his way to Sarah. But Jacob traveled on to Succoth, and he built for himself a house, and he made shelters for his livestock. Therefore he called the name of the place Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Paddan Aram. And he camped before the city, and he bought a piece of land where he pitched his tent for one hundred pieces of money from the hand of the sons of Hammer, father of Shechem. And there he erected an altar and called it El Elo Israel. Just before we start, I want to draw the attention to verse 18. The English translation is not that good because the Hebrew verse is saying that Jacob arrives at Salem by the city of Shechem and if you don't remember back in week the deep dive of week four I did quite a long rabbit trail about and the city of Salem 
so this is one of the verses that I used in that deep dive so you're welcome to go back and listen to it okay let's start with chapter 33 okay I want to point out here in Genesis 33 verse 4 and 9 but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell upon his neck and kissed him and they wept and then Esau said I have enough my brother keep what you have such a great welcoming and reunion between the brothers. And we saw that Esau had compassion for him now at this point. Esau was blessed also with wealth because he said, I have enough, brother. Keep what you have. So that's an indicator that he was already plenty of wealthy with what Jacob was trying to give him. But was it by God? Was it by Isaac? Or was it by other means did Esau become wealthy? Let's read in Jubilees 29, 13 to 20. He passed over the Jabbok in the ninth month on the eleventh thereof. And on that day Esau, his brother, came to him, and he was reconciled to him, and departed from him unto the land of Seir. But Jacob dwelt in tents, and in the first year of the fifth week in this jubilee he crossed the Jordan, and dwelt beyond the Jordan. And he pastured his sheep from the sea of the heap unto Bethshem, and unto Dothan, and unto the forest of Akrabim. And he set to his father Isaac of all his substance, clothing, and food, and meat, and drink, and milk, and butter, and cheese, and some dates of the valley. And to his mother Rebekah also four times a year, between the times of the months, between plowing and reaping, and between autumn and the rain, and between winter and spring, to the tower of Abraham. For Isaac had returned from the well of the oath and gone up to the tower of his father Abraham, and he dwelt there apart from his son Esau. For in the days when Jacob went to Mesopotamia, Esau took to himself a wife Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael. And he gathered together all the flocks of his father and his wives, and went up and dwelt on Mount Seir, and left Isaac his father at the well of the oath alone. And Isaac went up from the well of the oath and dwelt in the tower of Abraham his father on the mountains of Hebron. And thither Jacob set all that he did send to his father and his mother from time to time, all they needed. And they blessed Jacob with all their heart and with all their soul. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, we're given details here in Jubilees, and it's quite sad. We see Esau takes his father's flocks and leaves Isaac and Rebekah alone. He does not support them. Because it, it clearly says Jacob is the one who supports them on a quarterly basis. Esau is thus not honoring his father or mother or his inheritance. If he was supposedly the firstborn getting the inheritance, the firstborn would be the one supporting his parents. And he's obviously showing he's not. And we will see this action regarding his own sons about honoring his parents. Esau's envy and jealousy plagues him. So the question is, does it plague you? I'm going to go through the testaments of the patriarchs regarding envy and jealousy and hatred and all of this stemming from the description about Esau. In the testament of Gad 7, 4 through 7, it says here, And though a man become rich by evil means, even as Esau, the brother of my father, be not jealous, but wait for the end of the Lord. For if he takes away from a man wealth gotten by evil means, he forgives him if he repent. But the unrepentant is preserved for eternal punishment. For the poor man, if free from envy, he pleases the Lord in all things, is blessed beyond all men, because he has not the labor of vain men. Put away therefore jealousy from your souls, and love one another with uprightness of heart. So when the father takes away things produced by evil means, that person must recognize that and repent. Otherwise, there will be repayment, and it won't be nice. Some insight to Esau's evil means manifesting from the envy of taking his father's flocks and jealousy he had of Jacob getting his parents' favor. So we got some insights from the Testament of God. Continuing. Going to talk about envy and pride keeps the world in unrest, troubled, and in war. And we get this from the warning and prophecy of Simeon, the Testament of Simeon 3, 2 through 7. And now, my children, hearken unto me and beware of the spirit of deceit and envy, 
For envy rules over the whole mind of a man, and suffers him neither to eat nor to drink, nor to do any good thing. But it ever suggests to him to destroy him that he envies. And so long as he that is envied flourishes, he that envies fades away. Two years, therefore, I afflicted my soul with fasting in the fear of the Lord, and I learnt that deliverance from envy comes by the fear of Yah. For if a man flees to the Lord, the evil spirits run away from him, mm-hmm. and his mind is lightened, and henceforward he sympathizes with him whom he envied, and forgives those who are hostile to him, and so ceases from envy. His repentance was sincere with two years of fasting and affliction in the fear of the Lord. He turned away from envy and loved and forgave others. Testament of Simeon 4, 5 through 7. Beware, therefore, my children, of all jealousy and envy, and walk in singleness of soul and with good heart, keeping in mind Joseph your father's brother, that God may give you also grace and glory and blessing upon your heads, even as you saw in Joseph's case. All his days he reproached us not concerning this thing, but loved us as his own soul, and beyond his own sons glorified us, and gave us riches and cattle and fruits. Do you also, my children, love each one his brother with a good heart, and the spirit of envy will withdraw from you? Beware of the evil spirits in you and around you, is what he is saying. So take note. By loving one another with a good heart, the spirit of envy will withdraw from you. It's about love. Testament of Simeon 6, 2 through 7, 3. Now, if you remove from you your envy and all stiff neckedness, as a rose shall my bones flourish in Israel, and as a lily my flesh in Jacob, and my odor shall be as the odor of Lebanus, and the cedar shall holy ones be multiplied from me forever, and their branches shall stretch afar off. Then shall perish the seed of Canaan, and the remnant shall not be unto Amalek, and all the Cappadocians shall perish, and all the Hittites shall utterly be destroyed. Then shall the land of Ham fail, and all the people shall perish. All of this is if your envy and all your stiff nakedness is removed. Okay? All right, continuing. Then shall all the earth rest from trouble, and all the world under heaven from war, then the mighty one of Israel shall glorify Shem, for the Lord God shall appear on earth and himself save men. Then shall all the spirits of the seat be given to be trodden underfoot, and men shall rule over wicked spirits. Then shall I arise in joy and will bless the Most High because of his marvelous works. And now, my children, obey Levi and Judah, and be not lifted up against these two tribes, For from them shall arise unto you the salvation of Yah. For the Lord shall raise up from Levi as it were a high priest, and from Judah as it were a king. He shall save all the Gentiles and the race of Israel. Therefore I give you these commands, that you also may command your children, that you may observe them through their generations. So we learned loving one another with a good heart, Walking in singleness of soul, not double-mindedness, will free you from evil spirits. Now, let's talk about the spirits of deceit and envy. They pollute the mind with corruption. Testament of Issachar 3, 5 through 5, 5. Therefore, when I was 35 years old, I took to myself a wife. For my labor wore away my strength, and I never thought upon pleasure with women. But owing to my toil, sleep overcame me. And my father always rejoiced in my integrity. Because I offered through the priest of the Lord all first fruits, then to my father also, and the Lord increased ten thousand fold his benefits in my hands, and also Jacob, my father, knew that Yah aided my singleness, for on all the poor and oppressed, I bestowed the good things of the earth in the singleness of my heart, and now hearken to me, my children, and walk in singleness of your heart, for I have seen in it all that it well-pleasing to the Lord. The single-minded man covets not gold. He overreaches not his neighbor. He longs not after many dainties. He, He delights not in varied apparel. He does not 
desire to live a long life, but only waits for the will of Yah. And the spirit of the seat have no power against him, for he looks not on the beauty of women, lest he should pollute his mind with corruption. There is no envy in his thoughts. No malicious person makes his soul to pine away. Nor worry with insatiable desire in his mind. For he walks in singleness of soul, and behold all things in uprightness of his heart. Shunning eyes made evil through the error of the world, lest he should see the perversion of any of the commandments of the Lord. Keep therefore, my children, the law of Yah, and get singleness, and walk in guilelessness, not playing the busybody with the busyness of your neighbor. But love the Lord and your neighbor. Have compassion on the poor and the weak. Bow down your back unto husbandry, and toil in labors in all manner of husbandry, offering gifts to the Lord with thanksgiving for the first fruits of the earth. Will the Lord bless you, even as he blessed all the saints from Abel unto now? For no other portion is given to you than the fatness of the earth, whose fruits are raised by toil. We see here what we should do against the spirits of deceit and envy. Walk in singleness of your heart and keep the Torah of Elohim. Walk in sincerity. Love Yah and love your neighbor. Work hard in all manner of husbandry. Have compassion on the poor and the weak. Offer gifts to the Lord with thanksgiving. Now we're going to talk hatred is evil and works with envy against those who prosper. We see this in the Testament of Gad 4, 1 through 5, 3. Beware therefore, my children, of hatred, for it works lawlessness even against the Lord himself. For it will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the loving of one's neighbor, and it sins against God. For if a brother stumble, it delights immediately to proclaim it to all men, and is urgent that he should be judged for it, and be punished, and be put to death. And if it be a servant, it stirs him up against his master, and will every affliction it desire against him. If possibly, he can be put to death. For hatred works with envy, also against them that prosper, so long as it hears of or sees their success, it always languishes. For as love would quicken even the dead, and would call back them that are condemned to die, so hatred would slay the living, and those that had sinned lightly it would not suffer to live. For the spirit of hatred works together with Satan, through hastiness of spirits, in all things to men's death. But the spirit of love works together with the law of Yah in long suffering unto the salvation of men. Hatred, therefore, is evil, for it constantly mates with lying, speaking against the truth. And it makes small things to be great, and causes the light to be darkness, and calls the sweet bitter, and teaches slander, and kindles wrath, and stirs up war, and violence, and all covetedness. It fills the heart with evils and devilish poison. These things, therefore, I say to you from experience, my children, that you may drive forth hatred, which is of the devil, and cleave to the love of Yah. Righteousness casts out hatred. Humility destroys envy. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust, being reproved not of another, but by his own heart, because the Lord looks on his inclination. We see that the spirit of love works together with the Torah of Elohim in long suffering unto salvation of men. Cleave to the teachings of Elohim. Obedience to it casts out hatred. Humility destroys evil. Let's talk about envy, hatred, slavery, slander, and evil doings. They all shall be punished. In the Testament of Benjamin, 7, 5 through 8, 3, Because for ever those who are like Cain in envy and hatred of brethren shall be punished with the same judgment. And do you, my children, flee evil doing, envy and hatred of brethren, and cleave to the goodness and love. He that has a pure mind and love looks not after a woman with a view to fornication, for he has no defilement in his heart because the spirit of Yah rests upon him.
For as the sun is not defiled by shining on the dung and mire, but rather dries up both and drives away the evil smell, so also the pure mind, though encompassed by the defilements of earth, rather cleanses them and is not itself defiled. In the Testament of Joseph 10.3-11.1 through 11, 1. And wheresoever the Most High dwells, even though envy or slavery or slander befalls a man, the Lord who dwells in him for the sake of his chastity not only delivers him from the evil, but also exalts him even as me. For in every way the man is lifted up, whether in deed or in word or in thought. My brethren knew how my father loved me, and yet I did not exalt myself in my mind. Although I was a child, I had the fear of Yah in my heart, for I knew that all things would pass away, and I did not raise myself against them with evil intent. But I honored my brethren, and out of respect for them, even when I was being sold, I refrained from telling the Ishmaelites that I was the son of Jacob, a great man and a mighty. Do you also, my children, have the fear of Yah in all your works before your eyes, and honor your brethren, for every one who does the law of the Lord shall be loved by him. We see the wisdom of Joseph. Just amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Flee from evil doing, envy and hatred, and cleave to goodness, love, and the Torah, having the fear of Elohim in your heart. Walk in obedience and honor your brethren, for everyone who does the Torah of Yah shall be loved by him. And we see this also in the New Testament with John 14, 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them means they're doing them. That one is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him. This is Yeshua talking. Then in 1 John 3, 1. See what sort of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And we are. Because of this, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Why does the world not know us or him? Because they do not love him. They do not walk in his commandments and love. That is why. After going over the Testaments about envy, hatred, we see that the result is basically love, righteousness following the Torah in obedience. All right, so I wanted to end with that. And then switching gears to Esau attacks Jacob after Isaac passes away. We see the reunion where they come together. It's emotional. They kiss each other. They're happy. They're, it's a great reunion. And then 18 years go by, and then their father passes away. And sadly, shortly after that, Esau attacks his brother, and we're going we're gonna to read to understand what happens here. But in the Testament of Judah, it states, 9, 1 through 8, And 18 years after my father abode in peace with my brother Esau, and this is Judah speaking, and his sons with us, after that we came to Mesopotamia and from Laban, and when 18 years were fulfilled in the 40th year of my life, Esau, the brother of my father, came upon us with a mighty and strong people, and Jacob smote Esau with an arrow. And he was taken up, wounded, to Mount Seir. And as he went, he died at Ananiram. <laughs> and we pursued after the son of Esau. Now they had a city with walls of iron and gates of brass. And we could not enter into it. And we encompassed around and besieged it. And when they opened not for us in twenty days, I set up a ladder in the sight of all. And my shield upon my head, head I went up, sustaining the assault of stones upward. Three talents wait, and I slew four of their mighty men, and Reuben and Gad slew six others. Then they asked from us terms of peace, and having taken counsel with our father, we received them as tributaries, and they gave us 500 cores of wheat, 500 baths of oil, 500 measures of wine, until the famine when we went down to Egypt. We see what happens after his father dies. And so what I want to do next is give some insights to this because Jubilees gives more details to this event of Esau attacking Jacob in Jubilees 37. This is Jubilees chapter 37. On the day that Isaac the father of Jacob and Esau died, the sons of Esau heard that Isaac had given the portion of the elder to his younger son Jacob. 
and they were very angry, and they strove with their father, saying, Why has your father given Jacob the portion of the elder and passed over you, although you are the elder and Jacob the younger? And he said unto them, Because I sold my birthright to Jacob for a small mess of lentils. And on the day my father set me to hunt and catch and bring him something that he should eat and bless me. He came with guile and brought my father food and drink, and my father blessed him and put me under his hand. And now our father has caused us to swear, me and him, that we shall not mutually devise evil, either against his brother, and that we shall continue in love and in peace each with his brother, and not make our ways corrupt. And they said unto him, We shall not hearken unto you to make peace with him, for our strength is greater than his strength, and we are more powerful than he. We shall go against him and slay him, and destroy him and his sons. And if you wilt not go with us, we shall do hurt to you also. And now hearken unto us, let us send to Aram and Philistia and Moab and Ammon, and let us choose for ourselves chosen men who are zealous for battle, and let us go against him and do battle with him, and let us exterminate him from the earth before he grows strong. And their father said unto them, Do not go and do not make war with him, lest you fall before him. And they said unto him, This too is exactly your mode of action from your youth until this day, and you are putting your neck under his yoke. We shall not hearken to these words. And they said to Aram, and to Adura, to the friend of their father, and they hired along with them one thousand fighting men, chosen men of war. And there came to them from Moab and from the children of Ammon, those who were hired, one thousand chosen men, and from Philistia, one thousand chosen men of war, and from Edom and from the Horites, one thousand chosen fighting men and from the kid of mighty men of war. And they said unto their father, Go forth with them and lead them, else we shall slay thee. And he was filled with wrath and indignation on seeing that his sons were forcing him to go before them to lead them against Jacob his brother. But afterward he remembered all the evil which lay hidden in his heart against Jacob his brother. And he remembered not the oath which he had sworn to his father and to his mother that he would devise no evil all his days against Jacob his brother. And notwithstanding all this, Jacob knew not that they were coming against him to battle. And he was mourning for Lee, his wife, until they approached very near to the tower with four thousand warriors and chosen men of war. And the men of Hebron said to him, saying, Behold, your brother has come against you to fight you with four thousand girt with the sword, and they carry shields and weapons, for they loved Jacob more than Esau. So they told him, for Jacob was a more liberal and merciful man than Esau. But Jacob would not believe until they came very near to the tower, and he closed the gates of the tower, and he stood on the battlements and spoke to his brother Esau, and said, Noble is the comfort wherewith you have come to comfort me for my wife who has died. Is this the oath that you did swear to your father and again to your mother before they died? You have broken the oath, and on the moment that you did swear to your father was you condemned. And then Esau answered and said unto him, Neither the children of men nor the beasts of the earth have any oath of righteousness, which in swearing they have sworn a valid oath forever. But every day they devise evil one against another, and how each may slay his adversary and foe. And you do hate me and my children forever, and there is no observing the tie of brotherhood with you. Hear these words which I declare unto you, if the boar can change its skin and make its bristles as soft as wool, or if it can cause horns to sprout forth on its head like the horns of a stag or of a sheep, then will I observe the tie of brotherhood with you, and if the breasts separated themselves from their mother, for you have not been a brother to me, and if the wolves make peace with the lambs so as not to devour or do them violence, and if their hearts are towards them for good, then there shall be peace in my heart towards you, and if the lion becomes the friend of the ox and makes peace with him, and if he is bound under one yoke with him and plows with him, then will I make peace with you. And when the raven becomes white as the raza, then know that I have loved you and shall make peace with you. You shall be rooted out, and your sons shall be rooted out, and there shall be no peace for you. And when Jacob saw that he was so evilly disposed towards him with his heart, and with all his soul as to slay him, and that he had come springing like the wild boar which comes upon the spear that pierces and kills it, and recoils not from it, then he spoke to his own and to his servants that they should attack him and all his companions. And after that Judah spoke to Jacob, his father, and said unto him, Then your bow, father, and send forth your arrows, and cast down the adversary, and slay the enemy. And may you have the power, for we shall not slay your brother, for he is such as you, and he is like you. Let us give him this honor. Then Jacob bent his bow, and set forth the arrow, and struck Esau, his brother, on his right breast, and slew him. Very sad. And I wanted to point out that Jacob thought... When Esau arrived, he didn't believe what the other guys were telling him. No, my, no, my brother's not here against me. He was thinking he was here to comfort him about his wife's passing. And it wasn't until he spoke with him 
that he saw the evil intent in his heart. He saw the whole paragraph of what Esau said to his brother. He was intent to slay him. It was just very sad. I like what Judah says, and may you have the power. And we know that Judah was given the power to triumph over his enemies. And here's Judah giving it to his father to make sure that it happens. So I wanted to share details in Jubilees about Esau and talk about all of the evil of Esau stemming from envy and how it can pollute your mind and cause hatred and just stir up such wrath. It's, yeah. And in these slides, I also gave all of the positives of what we should be doing so that we have no envy and this evil within us. Very interesting, very interesting. The thing is that it looked like Esau was comfortable living in peace with Jacob. It's his sons that harbored the hatred and jealousy. And so when, that when I read this, I thought that at, at first Esau was fine. And it wasn't until his sons threatened him and brought back those memories. Yeah. And then it says Esau Remember. remembered. And yeah. that's the problem. He brought it all back up and it consumed him. That spirit of hatred, that spirit of envy, he rose back. He let it in. Mm -hmm. And I think he let it in because of what his sons were, were saying and pushing him mm -hmm. in the corner to do. And that reminds me of us. Are we harboring anything within ourselves, whether it's envy, whether it's hatred towards someone in our past? And when it comes back up, how are we going to deal with it? Are we going to forgive them? Are we going to let it go? Or is it something that's always bugging us in the background? If it is, we just read what we should be doing about it. So I hope that if whoever's listening, if you're struggling with any of that, read the comments or read what it says here, what they're telling us to do. I like what it said here, walk in singleness of heart, keep the Torah of Elohim, work hard in all manner of husbandry. This, he's telling his children to do this. I'm like, these are great yes. things to do. Walk in sincerity, love Yah, love your neighbor, have compassion for the poor and weak, offer gifts to the Lord with thanksgiving. All of this, we know we should be doing this anyway, but the one I didn't know about is work hard in all manner of husbandry. That was interesting. Yeah, that's what it was meant to be that way. That's yeah. quote work, and that's what we should be doing. This is Genesis chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And Shechem, the son of Hammer the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, and he took her and lay with her and raked her. And his soul clung to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to the girl. So Shechem said to Hammer his father, saying, Get this girl for me as a wife. And Jacob heard that Dinah his daughter had been defiled, but his sons were with his flocks in the field. And Jacob kept silent until they came. And Hammer, father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were distressed and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by having sexual relations with the daughter of Jacob, something that should not be done. And Hammer spoke with them, saying, Shechem, my son, is in love with your daughter. Please give her to him for a wife. Make marriages with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Settle and trade in it, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will do. Make the bride price and gift as high as you like. I will give what you say to me, but give me the girl as a wife. Then the sons of Jacob answered Shechem, and his father Hammer speaking deceitfully, because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to a man who is uncircumcised, for that is a disgrace for us. Only on this condition will we give consent to you, if you will become like us, every male among you to be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take for ourselves your daughters, and we will live with you and become one family. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughters and we will go. And their words were good in the eyes of Hammer and in the eyes of Shechem, the son of Hammer. And the young man did not delay to do the thing, for he wanted the daughter of Jacob. Now he was the most honored of his father's house. Then Hammer and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city, and they spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land, and let them trade in it. Now, behold, the land is broad enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men give consent to us, to live with us and to become one family, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. 
Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us give consent to them so they will live among us. And all those who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hammer and his son Shechem. Every male was circumcised, all those who went out of the gate of the city. And it happened that on the third day, while they were in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, the brothers of Dinah, each took his sword and came against the unsuspecting city and killed all the males. They killed Hammer and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword, and they took Dinah from the house of Shechem and went out. The other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their cattle and their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and whatever was in the field. They captured and plundered all that was in the houses, all their wealth, their little ones, and their women. Then Jacob said to Simon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me, making me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I am few in number. If they gather against me and attack me, I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, Shall he treat our sister like a prostitute? Thoughts and insights on chapter 34. So first I want to share additional details regarding denying Shechem from the book of Jubilees. In, I wanted to compare the two accounts in Genesis and Jubilees. So in Genesis it says, Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, the prince of the land, saw her. And he took her and lay with her and... Actually, in Hebrew, it doesn't say raped. It says talk to her. Like the word could be either talk to her or tortured her. And his soul clung to Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to the girl. They killed her more and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword, and they took Dina from the house of Shechem and went out. I jumped to verse 26. Now I want to compare to Jubilees. 31 through 4. In the first year of the sixth week, he went up to Salem, to the east of Shechem, in the fourth month, and he went in peace. Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, the prince of the land, carried off Dina, the daughter of Jacob, into the house, and he had sex with her and defiled her. She was a little girl, a child of 12 years. He begged his father and her brothers that she might be given to him as a wife. Jacob and his sons were very angry because of the men of Shechem, for they had defiled Dina, their sister. They spoke to them while planning evil acts, and they dealt deceitfully with them and tricked them. Simeon and Levi came unexpectedly to Shechem and ex executed judgment on all the men of Shechem and killed all the men whom they found in it. They did not leave a single one remaining in it. They killed all in hand-to-hand -hand battle because they had dishonored their sister Dina. So, few points. Notice that Jubilees does not mention that Dina going out to see the daughters of the land, Shechem being tender with Dina, Hamor is negotiating and offering a generous offer for the marriage, and Jacob's son tricking Hamor and Shechem into circumcising their people. None of these details are reported in Jubilees. Notice how Genesis refers to Dina as the daughter of Leah, while Jubilees refer to her as the daughter of Jacob. According to Jubilees 28-23, Genesis also neglected to tell us that Dina was the twin sister of Zebulun. So here is a verse from Jubilees. Jacob went in again to Leah, and she conceived and gave birth to two children, a son and a daughter, and she called the name of the son Zebulun and the name of the daughter Dina in the seventh day of the seventh month, in the sixth year of the fourth week. I thought that's an interesting detail. Okay, Jubilees 30, 18 through 26. 
the offspring of Levi were chosen for the priesthood and to be Levites. They might minister before Yah, as we do continually. Levi and his sons will be blessed forever, for he was zealous to execute righteousness and judgment and vengeance on all those who arose against Israel. So they wrote a testimony in his favor of blessing and righteousness on the heavenly tablets in the presence of the Elohim of all. We remember the righteousness that the man fulfilled during his life throughout the years until a thousand generations they will record it. It will come to him and his descendants after him and he has been recorded on the heavenly tablets as a friend and as a righteous man. On the day when the sons of Jacob killed Shechem, it was written in the record in their favor in heaven that they had executed righteousness and uprightness and vengeance on the sinners, and it was written for a blessing. They brought Dina, their sister, out of the house of Shechem. They took everything that was in Shechem captive. They took their sheep and their oxen and their donkeys and all their wealth and all their flocks and brought them all to Jacob their father. He reproached them because they had put the city to the sword for he feared those who dwelt in the land, the Canaanites and the Prezites. The dread of Yah was on all the cities that are near Shechem. They did not fight or chase after the sons of Jacob, for terror had fallen on them. So, according to Jubilees, Levi came out the big winner of this story. Notice that contrary to verse 26, which records the ensuing dread of the surrounding nations of the sons of Jacob following the massacre and sacking of the city, Genesis records Jacob's dread of the surrounding nations. In Genesis verse 30, we read, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me, making me sting among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I am few in number. If they gather against me and attack me, I will be destroyed, I and my household. So that's interesting contrast here. Let me continue. Okay, so I have some more thoughts after I did some more research and more reading and looking for more second and third witnesses as I usually do. And let's see what I came up with. So the story of Dina is a story full of silence. It is commonly thought that the story begins when Dina decides to go out and see the daughters of the land, or even earlier when Jacob settles in Salem by the city of Shechem. But in fact, the story begins even earlier. Dina's story opens somewhere in Haran at the time of her birth when the text is silent and does not elaborate about the essence of her name. Unlike her 12 brothers whose names each has a specific meaning, in Genesis 30, 19 through 21, and Leah conceived again and gave birth to a sick son for Jacob. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good gift. This time my husband will acknowledge me because I bore him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. And afterward she gave birth to a daughter and she called her name Dina. Nothing about what her name means. As mentioned before, the text is also silent in regard to her being born as a tw the twin of Zebulun, as I just read before. Her story continues when Laban catches up with Jacob and his family in Galed. Remember that it's Galed, not Gilead, okay? So Laban exclaims that Jacob's wives, sons, and flocks all belong to him, mentioning the sons twice, but Jacob's only daughter not even once. 
in Genesis 31 43 then Laban answered and said to Jacob the daughters are my daughters and the sons are my sons and the flocks are my flocks and all that it is mine now what can I do for these my daughters today or for their sons whom they have born her story or maybe at this point I should say non story continues during her family's crossing of the Jabok River. Dina is yet again absent, not even counted in the number of Jacob's children, as if she did not exist in Genesis 32 to uh, 32 22. That night Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female slaves and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabok. Okay. Most of what we hear of Dina appears in Genesis 34. But even though she is the main character in this story, we hardly learn anything about her. Even after Shechem texts her, the text does not tell about the conversation that takes place between Dina and her family. None of her relatives stop to check what Dina wants and her feelings. Throughout her story, she does not communicate with the other characters and does nothing for herself, except for two important actions, going out and seeing. Where did she go out and what did she see? Since the first three verses are vague, there are two ways to read this story. Either this is a story of a brutal rape of a girl, which ends in a blood revenge by her brothers or this is a love story of a young couple which ends in a brutal murder against the background of dishonoring the family. The second interpretation is supported by the fact that the word Vayeanea in verse 2 may have several meanings. It can mean torture or abuse but it can also mean talked to. The second meaning happens to be in complete alignment with verse 3 from which we learn that Shechem loved the girl and spoke tenderly to the girl. It seems that Shechem is the only one who really sees Dina, calls her name and responds to her words and wishes. And his soul clung to Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to the girl. Whether Dina's story is about rape or about the realization of love, there is one fact that is hard to dispute. Among her family members, Dina is muted, passive, voiceless character who does not decide her fate. I am of the opinion that it is highly likely that Shechem kidnapped Dina and had sexual contact with her to establish marriage. In other words, Shechem did not rape Dina, but rather kidnapped her from a local women's celebration where they were both present with the intention of marrying her. The ensuing negoti negotiations between Hamor and Jacob had no legal meaning and were only intended to prevent future hostility between both sides. Reluctantly, Jacob agreed to the marriage on the condition that the people of Shechem be circumcised. However, his sons, and especially Simeon and Levi, did not agree to their sister's marriage to Shechem, and a conflict arose between them and Jacob over the question of how to respond to Shechem's request to marry their sister. Jacob did not forgive Simeon and Levi for what they did next. Here is how he blessed, quote-unquote, them on his deathbed. Genesis 49, 5-7 Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let me not come into their counsel. Let not my person be joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and at their pleasure they hamstrung cattle. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath 
for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and I will scatter them in Israel. The phenomenon of abduction marriages knows no bounds, geographical or religious. There is evidence of the existence of abduction marriages in the Bible, Mishnah, Talmud, and in the records of other nations, such as the Mesopotamians, the Hittites, and the Canaanites. An abduction marriage was under certain circumstances an alternative to the customary marriage. The main motive for this marriage was parental refusal to give their daughter to the man who wanted to marry her. The man rejected by the bride's family restores his dignity through kidnapping. For the most part, the bride was kidnapped while she was outside her house on her way somewhere. If the kidnapping was successful, the girl was taken to a location that her family members could not find and her intended husband would have sexual contact with her to establish the marriage. Sounds familiar? In case you are doubting what I just proposed, let's review the last three chapters of the book of Judges. There, in the story of the concubine and the Levite, we are going to learn about abduction marriages in Israel. Yes, you already tried. Please, play Please pay close attention to the geography of this story. You will find it eerily familiar. And next, I am going to share with you the story in the last three chapters of the book of Judges. It's not an easy story to listen to. Let me start. Just Judges chapter 19. Warning, this chapter is ugly. It will remind you of another chapter in Genesis. A concubine slash wife of a Levite who dwelt as a foreigner in the remote areas of the hill country of Ephraim leaves her husband and goes to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. Her husband follows her there to try and win her back. He speaks tenderly to her and convinces her to come back with him. On their way home, they pass opposite Yevus, that is Jerusalem, and the husband refuses to stay in a city of foreigners who are not from the Israelites. So they come to a Benjamite city called Gibeah, or Giva, located just north of Jerusalem. It was the birthplace of Saul and continued to be his residence after he became king, by the way. It's getting late, but they can't find a place to spend the night, so they just sit down in the open square of the city, but no one took them in to spend the night. An old man who was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was dwelling as a foreigner in Gibeah, sees them and graciously invites them to stay the night in his house. He feeds them and their donkeys and they are having a good time until they hear a pounding at the door. It's a group of Benjamite locals demanding, bring out the man who came to your house so that we may have sex with him. So the old man tells this man, No, my brothers, do not act wickedly since this man has come into my house. Do not do this disgraceful thing. Here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Please let me bring them out to do violence to them and do to them whatever you please. Do not do this disgraceful thing to this man. Sounds familiar? Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. No deal said the door-to-door -door rapist, but the Levite brings out his concubine anyway, and the men of the city take her away and rap her all night. They finally let her go when the sun begins to rise. She makes it back to the old man's house and collapses in front of the door. Her husband finds her when he opens the door and says, Good morning, sunshine. Ready to go home? Oh, sorry. He actually says, get up, let us go. She doesn't answer, she is dead. 
So he loads her onto his donkey and returns home. When he arrives, he chops her into 12 pieces and mails one piece to every tribe of Israel. Remember, in those days there was no king in Israel, anything goes. Nevertheless, word of this atrocity spreads across Israel and the people are outraged. All who saw it said nothing like this has ever been since the Israelites went up from the land of Egypt until this day. Take note of it, consider it, and speak up. I would like to take a moment to reiterate that this chapter is really ugly. Next, chapter 20. Israel destroys Benjamin for that awful business back in chapter 19. All of Israel, except of the Benjamites, gathers to discuss this horrific affair. The Levite husband tells his story and Israel decides to kill the man of Gibeah who did the deed. They demand that the tribe of Benjamin give up the guilty man in Gibeah. But the people of the tribe of Benjamin refuse to hand them over. Instead, they gather a force of 26,000 sword wielding men plus 700 well-trained men from Gibeah to go to war against Israel. Israel gathers a huge force, 400,000 sword-wielding men, all were warriors to be precise, including 700 left-handed soldiers who could sling stones with devastating accuracy. I guess if judges teaches us anything, it's don't mess with lefties. So the Israelite got up and went up to Bethel. Bethel, okay? And they inquired of God, saying, Who will go up first for the battle against the descendants of Benjamin? And Yahweh said, Judah will go first. Quick reminder, Bethel was considered a holy city and was the location of the Ark of the Covenant. It was part of the inheritance of the tribe of Ephraim. At times of crisis, the tribes would go to Bethel to seek for answers from Yahweh. Bethel is also where Jacob had his dream on the way to Haran. But Benjamin defeats Israel in their first battle. They struck down on that day 22,000 men of Israel to the ground. Israel is worried, so they ask Yah whether they should continue the war. Yah promises that tomorrow he will deliver Benjamin into Israel's hands. In the next battle, the Israelites slaughter Benjamin. Only 600 Benjamites managed to escape into the wilderness to a place called the Rock of Rimon. Israel's army continues its war against Benjamin, killing every man and beast and burning every Benjamite city. Judges chapter 21. Their dating options exhausted, the Benjamites resort to kidnapping some wives. So let's check this chapter. Now that they have all but destroyed Benjamin, the Israelite vowed to put the death to death anyone that refused to go to war against Benjamin. As they are tracking down draft dodgers, their tempers cool down and Israel starts to feel badly about their genocidal anti-Benjamite campaign. On second thought, they don't want to wipe an entire tribe off the face of the earth. Unfortunately, they have all sworn an unbreakable oath to never allow a Benjamites to marry their daughters dooming that tribe to eventually die out. While they are puzzling over this, they discover that the inhabitants of Yavesh Gal Ed, not Gilad, Gal Ed, didn't send any soldiers to the war. So they send an army to kill every male and every non-virgin woman, somewhat ironically given their regret over the whole kill all the Benjamites thing. The army brings back 400 virgin captives from Yavesh Galed. So they send an ambassador to the Rock of Rimon and Benjamin returned at that time and they gave to them the women whom they kept alive from Yavesh Galed, but they were not enough for them. Because remember, there were 600 of them. Unfortunately, that still leaves a lot of Benjamites without a wife. So what to do for them? The elders of Israel have a brilliant idea. 
they tell the Benjamites to go to Shiloh, which do you remember that in week four deep dive I suggested that Shiloh and Salem are one and the same. So they tell the Benjamites to go to Shiloh. What's in Shiloh, you ask? The annual feast of Yahweh is in Shiloh. What a coincidence. Shiloh, Salem, she goes out to that annual thing to watch the girls. Okay, so the annual feast of Yahweh is in Shiloh, which is to the north of Bethel, east of the main road that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebona. Are you convinced yet that Shiloh and Salem are one and the same? Each year the people of Shiloh have a feast unto Yahweh. During the feast the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance. Okay. The elders instruct the Benjamites to go lie in ambush in the vineyards and watch and look when the daughters of Shiloh dance in the dances, come out from the vineyards and seize for yourselves a wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. So the descendants of Benjamin did likewise, and they took wives for each of them from the dancers whom they seized, and they went and returned to their territory, and they rebuilt the cities, and they lived in them, and they all lived wickedly ever after, because lest we forget, in those days there was no king in Israel, each one did what was right in his own eyes. And this is literally the last verse of the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel, each one did what was right in his own eyes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the rape and murder of one woman was resolved with the abduction marriages of hundreds of other women. Wow. <laughs> I know. Wow. I know that was a rabbit trail. <laughs> wow. It, it just saddens me to see how Israel just got to this point. Yes. And I guess it reminds me of this world today. There's good and there's lots of bad out there. And here, being Israel, it's just sad what's been prophesied and that it's coming true to them that they're just doing all of this bad stuff. And we read that in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, their warnings and prophecy of what will happen. And all of this just happening is just really sad. Yeah, so. so what do you think about what I'm proposing here, that basically it was an abduction marriage? I find it eerily odd that it's in the same location. Pretty yeah. much the same location. Yeah. Okay, and it's basically... Yeah, um, I think what you put together... Yeah definitely hands that to being an abduction marriage. Yeah. It's certainly well viable of it happening with the Hebrew word, with its meaning, and plus with looking at the words that were said beforehand yeah. with the conversation being tender and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, it's very yeah. likely. And as you even showed here with what happened to the Benjamites and what they did. Yep, yeah, I would say it's definitely, definitely possibly what happened. Okay, we're open to any questions, any comments on what I just shared on chapter 34. So that was very interesting. Those, Roni, both those stories that you read are ones that, like, I don't know if anyone else has this, but since I've known those stories, every time I get to that part, I, like, cringe and, like, I know what's going to happen. I really hate both those stories at the end of Judges and with Dina yeah. or Dinah. I, it's just, uh, but to add something extra about, and that's very interesting, that, I mean, I, I never really put that together, the kidnapping, but there's also additional details about the story with Dinah in the Testament of Levi, and it says something like, I'm going back to look at it here, but it's like where he goes up and he has this vision, and then he's told in his vision that he's given like a shield and a sword, and he's told to execute judgment. Yes. And he says, execute vengeance on Shechem because of Dina, your sister. And he says, I destroyed at that time the sons of Hamor as it was written in the heavenly tablets. Yes. Uh, and then there was something else there, too, about the circumcision, whereas maybe there was, they weren't all in one accord in telling them to get circumcised. I can't remember exactly. But it was definitely, it clearly was wrong what they did because it seemed like I know Jacob got mad at them, but they, like, it looks like Levi was told. 
to execute the judgment. Yeah. I, I never put together that story with the abduction with the, the Shiloh with the ladies the dancing and then the Jemites taking them and making up for the, yeah, that's, yeah. that was very interesting. They, and it's the same location, pretty much. So that's what's amazing to me. This is Genesis chapter 35. And God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar to the God who appeared to you when you fled from before Esau your brother. Then Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods that are in your midst, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us make ready, and let us go up to Bethel, so that I can make an altar there, to the God who answered me in the day of my trouble, and who has been with me on the way that I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their hands, and the ornamental rings that were in their ears. And Jacob buried them under the oak which was near Shechem. Then they set out on their journey, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, so that they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, which was in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place out Bethel, for their God had appeared to him when he fled before his brother. And Deborah, the nurse of Rebekah, died, and she was buried below Bethel, under the oak, and its name was called Ellen Bacchath. And God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Then his name was called Israel. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and an assemblage of nations shall be from you, and kings shall go out from your loins. And as for the land that I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I will give it to you, and to your descendants after you I will give the land. And God went up from him at the place where he spoke with him. And Jacob set up a pillar at the place where God had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering upon it, and poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was the most difficult, the midwife said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have another son. And it happened that when her life was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob erected a pillar at her burial site. That is the pillar of the burial site of Rachel unto this day. And Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And while Israel was living in that land, Reuben went and had sexual relations with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Lee, the firstborn of Jacob, was Reuben. Then Simon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, the female slave of Rachel, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, the female slave of Lee, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. And Jacob came to Isaac his father at Mamre, or Kariath Arba, that is, Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac dwelled as aliens. Now the days of Isaac were one hundred and eighty years. And Isaac passed away and died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So before I start, I just wanted to go back and show you a few things that kind of caught my attention. In Hebrew, the word that is used, for example, in verse 14 is matseva, which means like a memorial monument. Usually it's just, it could be like a big stone or a bunch of stones. It's not a pillar. There is a word for a pillar in the Bible, and that word is not matseva. So I have no idea why in the many of the English translation they keep putting pillars. It bothers me because pillar is definitely how they used to worship Baal. So I want to make sure that people understand that what Jacob was building were not pillars. Okay. Yeah. Then another thing is on verse 18, I saw in many English translations, it says, son of my pain. Actually, Ben Oni is a son of my strength or vitality. On is strength or vitality. Okay, so I just wanted to make that point. Okay, so 
thoughts on chapter 35. So this is the third week in a row <laughs> that I'm I keep going to my theme of Thank you can you. get out of who but but you cannot get who out of you and and we've seen it several times in the past two weeks and I thought that those two verses when Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him get rid of the foreign gods that are in your midst and then they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their hands and the ornamental rings that were in their ears and then Jacob buried them. Then I looked in Jubilees, and in Jubilees it said, and on the first of the month, Jacob spoke to all the people of his house, saying, Purify yourselves, and change your garments, and let us arise, and go up to Bethel, where I vowed a vow to him on the day when I fled from the face of Esau, my brother, because he has been with me, and brought me into this land in peace and put away the strange gods that are among you and they gave up the strange gods and that which was in their ears and which was on their necks and the idols which Rachel stole from Laban her father she gave holy to Jacob I can't believe that until then she was still keeping those teraphim those idols so Interesting to find out that Jacob was fully aware that his wives were still holding on to foreign gods after so many years. With these verses, I think I finally rest the case regarding my proposition that living Ur and all that is it entails spiritually and culturally was an ongoing process for our patriarchs' families. Mm -hmm. Next. So I wanted to share additional details regarding Jacob's journey and Jacob's vision from Jubilees. This is Jubilees chapter 31. He went up on the first day of the seventh month to Bethel, and he built an altar at the place where he had slept, and he set up a pillar there, and he sent word to his father, Isaac, and his mother, Rebekah. He asked to come to Isaac. There, Jacob wished to offer his sacrifice. Isaac said, Let my son, Jacob, come and let me see him before I die. Jacob went to his father, Isaac, and his mother, Rebekah, to the house of his father, Abraham. And he took two of his sons with him, Levi and Judah. Rebekah came out from the tower to the front of it to kiss Jacob and embrace him. For her spirit had revived when she heard, Look, Jacob, your son has come. And she kissed him. She saw his two sons and she recognized them. She said to him, Are these your sons, my son? And she embraced them and kissed them and blessed them, saying, And you shall the offspring of Abraham become illustrious, and you shall prove a blessing on the earth. Jacob went into Isaac his father, to the room where he lay, and his two sons were with him. He took his father's hand, stooped down, and he kissed him. Isaac held on to the neck of Jacob his son and wept on his neck. The darkness left the eyes of Isaac, and he saw the two sons of Jacob, Levi and Judah, and he said, Are these your sons, my son? Because they look like you. He said to Isaac, They were truly my sons, and you have clearly seen that they are truly my sons. They came near to him, and he turned and kissed them and embraced them both together. The spirit of prophecy came down into his mouth, and he took Levi by his right hand and Judah by his left. He turned to Levi first, and began to bless him first, and said to him, May the Elohim of all, the very master of all the ages, bless you and your children throughout all the ages. May Yah give to you and your offspring greatness and great glory from among all flesh. May Yah cause you and your offspring to draw near to him to serve in his sanctuary like the messengers of the presence and as the pure ones. The offspring of your sons shall be for the glory and greatness and purity of the Elohim. May he make them great throughout all the ages. They shall be judges and princes, and chiefs of all the offspring of the sons of Jacob. They shall speak the word of Yah in righteousness, and they shall judge all his judgments in righteousness. They shall declare my ways to Jacob and my paths to Israel. The blessing of Yah shall be given in their mouths to bless all the offspring of the beloved. Your mother has called your name Levi, and rightly has she called your name. You will be joined to Yah and be the companion of all the sons of Jacob. Let his table be your table, and let your sons eat from it. May your table be full throughout all generations, and let your food not fail in all the ages. Let all who hate you fall down before you, and let all your adversaries be rooted out and perish. Blessed be he that blesses you, and cursed be every nation that curses you. To Judah he said, May Yah give you strength and power to put all that hate you under your feet. You and one of your sons will be a prince over the sons of Jacob. May your name and the name of your sons go out across every land and region. Then shall the Gentiles fear you, and all the nations and people shall shake. 
and you will be the help of Jacob, and in you will be found the salvation of Israel. When you sit on the throne, which honors of your righteousness, there shall be great peace for all the offspring of the sons of the beloved. Blessed be he that blesses you, and cursed be all that hate you, afflict you, or curse you. They shall be rooted out and destroyed from the earth. He turned, kissed him again, and embraced him, and rejoiced greatly, because he had seen the sons of his son, Jacob, clearly and truly. He stepped out from between his feet and fell down. He bowed down to him and blessed them. He rested there with Isaac, his father, that night, and they ate and drank with joy. He made the two sons of Jacob sleep, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. It was counted to him for righteousness. Jacob told his father everything during the night about how Yah had shown him great mercy and how he had caused him to prosper in all his ways, and how he protected him from all evil. Isaac blessed the Elohim of his father Abraham, who had not withdrawn his mercy and his righteousness from the sons of his servant Isaac. In the morning, Jacob told his father Isaac the vow which he had vowed to Yah. He told him of the vision which he had seen, and that he had built an altar. He told him that everything was ready for the sacrifice to be made before Yah as he had vowed. He had come to set him on a donkey. Isaac said to Jacob his son, I am not able to go with you, for I am old and not able to endure the way. Go in peace, my son. I am 165 years this day. I am no longer able to journey. Set your mother on a donkey and let her go with you. I know that you have come on my account, my son. May this day be blessed on which you have seen me alive, and I also have seen you, my son. May you prosper and fulfill the vow that you have vowed. Do not put off your vow, for you will be called to account for the vow. Now hurry to perform it, and may he who has made all things be pleased. It is to him you have vowed the vow. He said to Rebekah, Go with Jacob your son. And Rebekah went with Jacob her son, and Deborah with her. And they came to Bethel. Jacob remembered the prayer with which his father had blessed him and his two sons, Levi and Judah. He rejoiced and blessed the Elohim of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. He said, Now I know that my sons and I have an eternal hope in the Elohim of all. Thus is it ordained concerning the two. They recorded it as an eternal testimony to them on the heavenly tablets how Isaac blessed his sons. I just thought that was so beautiful wow. and way more detailed than the cliff notes that we got in Genesis on the on Jacob finally visiting his parents. One of the things that bewildered me is why did it take him such a long time? He, he arrived in Canaan and instead of going directly to see his parents that he hasn't seen in 20 years, he's settling down elsewhere and is who knows how many years have passed until he finally goes to see his parents. I thought I remember reading in there that he went to the Tower of Abraham, but I can't remember where that was in the timeline, and that's where his Isaac and Rebecca yeah. were. So and that, that, this that is may the have first been. Time that he is that what went. it says his first time? Yeah, back? This is, yeah that's the oh. first time that he went. After uh, several years, I'm assuming several years after he arrived in Canaan, so it always bewildered me. and. I have, I, have a, I have a thought that I cannot substantiate in my mind, but I think that he lingered and didn't go to visit them very quickly because there was a part in him that was a little bit embarrassed that he ended up with four wives, basically. Instead, because he, they sent him to get a wife and now he's coming back with four wives. Yeah. So I think that I have a feeling like this is just my own theory that he was a little bit embarrassed about it. And I think that's why the first visit that he went, he just went with two sons. He didn't go with the entire yeah, family. Right. That's it's just a postulation. I don't know if I'm right or not, but that's that was the thought that I had. Now, uh, I want to also share chapter 32, and that's about Jacob's vision. Okay, 32? Yeah. Or 22? 22. Maybe it's 22. It was Jubilee's chapter 22, 16 through 32. Yah appeared to him by night and blessed him and said to him, Your name shall not be called Jacob, but they will call your name Israel. And he said to him again, I am Yah who created the heaven and the earth, and I will increase you and multiply you greatly and kings shall come forth from you, and they shall be judges everywhere the foot of the sons of men have walked. I will give to your offspring all the earth that is under heaven, 
they shall judge all the nations as they desire. After that, they shall possess the entire earth and inherit it forever. And he finished speaking with him, and he went up from him. Jacob watched until he had ascended into heaven. In a vision at night, he saw a messenger descend from heaven with seven tablets in his hands, and he gave them to Jacob. And he read them and knew all that was written on it that would happen to him and his sons throughout all the ages. He showed him all that was written on the tablets and said to him, Do not build on this place and do not make it an eternal sanctuary and do not live here. This is not the place. Go to the house of Abraham your father and live with Isaac your father until the day he dies. For in Egypt you will die in peace and in this land you will be buried with honor in the sepulcher of your fathers with Abraham and Isaac. Do not fear, as you have seen and read it shall all be. Write down everything that you have seen and read. Jacob said, Master, how can I remember all that I have read and seen? He said to him, I will bring all things to your remembrance. He ascended from Jacob, and Jacob awoke from his sleep. He remembered everything that he had read and seen, and he wrote down all the words. In the night on the 23rd of this month, Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and they buried her beneath the city under the oak of the river. He called the name of this place the river of Deborah, and he called the oak of the morning of Deborah. Rebekah departed and returned to her house to his father Isaac. Jacob set rams and sheep and male goats by her so that she should prepare a meal for his father such as he desired. He followed his mother until he came to the land of Cabraton, and he lived there. Those are some more details about what transpired, because again, we got the Cliff Notes version in Genesis of Jacob went on a journey, and then while he was away from home, um, something happened back home that we will talk about in a moment. But so we got a little bit more details about about his vision and also what he I mean he probably was gone for a few months at least on this journey but that's really interesting details here and now it makes sense why we hear about the about Deborah like all of a sudden in Genesis it says oh Deborah died and then like we never even heard about her yeah. so at least here we learn a little bit more that Rebecca joined him on the journey but then her maid died on the journey and then she went back to Isaac okay so the last part of this chapter we have Reuben Reuben's betrayal of Jacob so in verse 22 and while Israel was living in that land Reuben went and had sexual relations with Bilhah his father's concubine and Israel heard about it now the sons of Jacob were 12 that's the verse so in the book of Jubilees 33, 2 through 9, we read this. Reuben saw Bilha, Rachel's maid, the concubine of his father, bathing in water in a secret place, and he loved her. He hid himself at night, and he entered the house of Bilha at night. He found her sleeping alone on a bed in her house. He had sex with her. She awoke and saw that it was Reuben lying with her in the bed. She uncovered the border of her covering and grabbed him and cried out when she discovered that it was Reuben. She was ashamed because of him and released her hand from him and he fled. Because of this she mourned greatly and did not tell it to anyone. When Jacob returned and sought her, she said to him, I am not clean for you. I have been defiled in regard to you. Reuben has defiled me and has had sex with me in the night. I was asleep and did not realize he was there until he uncovered my skirt and had sex with me. Jacob was very angry with Reuben because he had sex with Bilhah, because he had uncovered his father's skirt. Jacob did not approach her again because Reuben had defiled her. And as for any man who uncovers his father's skirt, his deed is wicked greatly, for he is disgusting to Yah. And that's a term that is used a lot later in the Torah, uncovering the father's skirt. It refers to basically having sexual relationship with the father's wife. So the testament of Reuben, we read how it's a long testament and I just took a few verses from it to share about what Reuben felt about what he did. And now my children love the truth. 
and it will preserve you. Hear you the words of Reuben, your father. Pay no heed to the face of a woman, nor associate with another man's wife, nor meddle with affairs of womankind. For had I not seen Bilha batting in a covered place, I had not fallen into this great iniquity. For my mind, taking in the thought of the woman's nakedness, suffered me not to sleep until I had trowed the abominable thing. For while Jacob, our father, had gone to Isaac, his father, when we were in Eder near to Ephrat in Bethlehem, Bilhah became drunk and was asleep uncovered in her chamber. Having therefore gone in and beheld her nakedness, I roused the impiety without her perceiving it. And leaving her sleeping, I departed. Pay. No heed therefore, my children, to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs, but walk in singleness of heart, in the fear of the Lord, and expend labor on good works, and on study, and on your flocks, until the Lord give you a wife, whom he will, that you suffer not as I did. For until my father's death I had not boldness to look in his face, or to speak to any of my brethren because of their reproach. Even until now my conscience caused me anguish on account of my impiety. And yet my father comforted me much and prayed for me unto the Lord, that the anger of the Lord might pass for me even as the Lord showed, and thenceforth until now I have been on my guard and sinned not. I just wanted to share those details about what Reuben did. I want to follow up on Reuben. Is it goes back to walk in singleness of heart in fear of the Lord. Yes. It's it, this singleness. It's single-minded focus and determination on walking in obedience, fearing Yah, and loving Him and your neighbor. They all say it. It's every, all the Testaments, yeah. they all got it. They all were like, this is what you should do. Yeah. And they were telling all their sons that this is what they should be doing. And they that's for learn. us to learn. Yeah, learn they all from. learn from their own mistakes. And yes. they want us not to make, to repeat the same mistakes. Any thought on chapter 35? Thoughts, insights, questions? From the audience. Why did he, why did Jake only take the Levi and the other son to see his father? He didn't take like the firstborn Reuben and Simeon, but he took Levi and I'm just wondering why he only took two of his children to go to see Isaac and why that was the two he took. I forgot. Levi with who was the other one? Levi and Judah. The, the, Judah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe he Maybe he already knew that those are the ones that are going to be leading the other tribes. They had a lot of they, they had a lot of knowledge through vision and communication that they got direct communication and also through their dreams. And then you see through Isaac blessing that I, that the spirit of prophecy was in him and he was prophesizing just that on those two sons so i yeah. that's the thought that comes to me yeah i was thinking like father the heavenly father must have instructed jacob that to take those two particular ones because levi the priest who comes priest priest yeah. comes through them yeah. and then the messiah comes through judah yeah so it must have been more to them receiving that blessing from isaac yes that father wanted right yeah them to be receive that yeah that's the only thing i was thinking too yes yeah i agree i like the insight that jubilee gives to to go with genesis it's very good to have to have that also gives yeah. you more and then the testament of Reuben too, with what he did with Doha. You know? Yeah. It's good it, stuff. I know. And it, I like it because so many times the toys, I, I call it cliff notes sometimes because you get one verse. So when you turn to those books, you get so many details behind that one verse. Yeah. And Jubilees has more details and same with the testaments, what they go to. Yeah. 
to see from Reuben and the testament that he gave to, to him to show his sorrow and, yes. and to instruct With his dentists. children and on down not to do as he did. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Let me just review the variants. It's a typo, it's chapter 33 through 35. And this time we had way more uh, scrolls from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls for Genesis, but I found only one insignificant difference. And then I found just a few differences between the Masoretic and the LXX. And if you go back later, you can see I color code everything. So again, not a lot of uh, variance between the versions that we are reading. Thank you, Father, for this time that we have together. We thank you, Father, for giving us this life, for opening our eyes, for loving us. Father, may we continue to walk in obedience, loving you, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and sharing that with others. Father, may you bless all those who hear the message, and may it inspire them to research and study more themselves and to walk in righteousness. Father, we ask for your blessings upon all those. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you.